So without further ado, mm -hmm. I'm going to introduce Joe. And you're going to talk about about carpenter and the history of the Carpentersville Business District. Which for some of, you, some of us locals, you know, we've just been doing our little walks mm -hmm. and we see, mm -hmm. wow, who's, who's doing all these changes to this building? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it'll be kind of fun to have you talk to that. Well, hey, Dolores. Hi there. Can we turn those lights down a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to get started with this here then, this presentation. This is entitled the Historic Business District of Carpentersville. And I think you're going to find this interesting, so I'm going to go back to the very beginning of how this town developed with regard to the carpenters. In fact, let's, let's raise a question to begin with. That question is on Carpentersville, how did it get its name? So often many people think that Carpentersville got its name because of carpenters. Carpenters lived here. You know, construction carpenters. And that's where the name came from. <laughs> that's not the case. We're going to find out that we need to go back to Uxbridge, Massachusetts to get the true answer as to why it is called Carpentersville. The date is August 19th, 1827. The proud parents are blessed with a baby boy whom they name Julius Angelo Carpenter. At this time, the United States is truly in its infancy. We just gained our independence 51 years earlier. By this date, 1827, there were 24 states in the Union. Expansion was taking place. During the following decade, the process of removing the native Indian tribes from the eastern United States was in full momentum, unfortunately. Few white men were apologetic, believing that the tribes in their homes were obstacles to the spread of a superior civilization. So by the middle 1830s, the settlers were taking possession of all the land east of the Mississippi. So 1837, this was a pivotal year for the territory that became the state of Illinois in 1818. That was just 19 years earlier. So on March 4th, 1837, for example, this is when Chicago was incorporated as a city. Anybody have an idea what the population was in 1837 for Chicago? Anyone want to take a guess at it? 800? Close. You're close. A little higher. It was 4,170. So that's all it was in 1837. A very small number. Yep. The Fox River at this time was also an area of interest to the pioneers coming from the east. So it was that in 1837, the Carpenter family started their journey from Uxbridge, Massachusetts, out west. And this was, at that time, the far west. This is as far as it went. So with the family, foodstuffs, livestock, and personal belongings, they traveled west by horse and wagon. So typically traveling at a rate of 7 to 10 miles on a good day and as little as 1 mile on others, it would have taken the Carpenter family, I figure, about 4 months to have reached the Fox Valley area. There weren't roads back then, you know. Much of this area was total wilderness. Here's where Uxbridge is located at, right there in the corner. You see that? got to get my pointer. Here's where Uxbridge, Massachusetts is located at. So they traveled all the way over here to our area, the Fox River. So they came upon the Fox River, and they decided to make this area their home. They had traveled 1,000 miles. Julius Angelo Carpenter, he was their son. He was about 10 years old at this time. So other pioneers soon followed the, them and also settled in this area with the Carpenters. And so they named this hamlet Originally, it was called Carpenter's Grove. The area had much to offer. It was rich in wildlife. The river was a huge resource for fish, clams, and fresh water. The river flowed crystal clear back then. Anybody seen pictures of the ice houses along the Fox River? There used to be ice houses all along the Fox River in this area, where they would cut ice during the wintertime, block ice, and keep it for the summer. It was a beautiful area to call home. 
Julius Angelo Carpenter, he was growing up. By the age of 22, in 1849, he took on his first business venture. He opened a store in the small hamlet of Carpenter's Grove. He had a remarkable business sense that was becoming apparent to his peers. This is his first endeavor. Not this building, but this is the location of Carpenter's store, his first store that he opened back in 1849. Everybody, you know where the building's at, right? Okay. So, but now this is, this is not the building that he built. This building that we're seeing today replaced the original store and still stands to this day. This building here was built in 1877, but by Julius Angelo Carpenter as well. So he built this, and it is, right, the Odd Fellows, and you've seen it today. Isn't it beautiful with the, the way they've um, refurbished that and beautified it? It's really something else. You know, the Odd Fellows have owned that building, I think from memory, I could be off by a year or two, but I think they've owned that building since like 1904. So they've been there for over 100 years. But anyway, getting back to this, in July of 1851, Julius Carpenter surveyed and he mapped out the town, showing the divisions of land, and he named the town Carpentersville. That's where Carpentersville got its name. It was from the Carpenter family and really from Julius Angelo Carpenter. He's the one who named this town. Here's a, a plan of survey that he himself had done, made in 1871. This shows the survey of Carpentersville. And on this survey, it's interesting, there's 147 residential lots. There is the various business area. There's, it's broken down here. Here, we see, for example, the Atlantic flour mills are right here. Um, here's this store that we pointed out a few minutes ago. The woolen mills are along here on the west side of the river. And then we have Illinois Iron and Bolt. And then, of course, we have here the Window and Sash Company, which we don't know about today because it's gone. But where auto manufacturing is today, in the, their parking lot behind their building, that was where the um, sash building, the Window and Sash building was that Carpenter used to use to manufacture wood, you know, um, sashes and windows and so on. But everything was based along the river, as you can see. And we're going to talk more about this here. These are water raceways which are very important, which we'll talk about in a little while. But this is a plan of survey in 1871. But note up here, what do you see different about this? There's no S. It's Carpenterville. So I don't know. Was that the way it was supposed to be originally? Was it really Carpenterville and not Carpentersville? I don't know. I haven't been able to determine that because it's always been Carpentersville, everything I found afterwards. But in 1871, this is what he called it. The 1871 survey shows results of 20 years of growth for this area that is named Carpentersville. But let's back up. Let's go back to 1851, the year that Carpenter planted and surveyed the town. This is also the year that the first wooden bridge was constructed over the Fox River in Carpentersville. The bridge was financed by J.A. Carpenter himself. He paid for the bridge. The business district of Carpentersville was developing at a quick pace for the time. The Atlantic Flour Mills was opened by Carpenter's uncles, Daniel and Joseph, in 1846. But this, by the way, is the oldest building still standing. And today we know it as the Main Street Bicycles. That's the building, 1846. Here's a picture of uh, a, a wooden plaque, actually, of the flouring mills. Here's an actual photograph. Here is, I'm going brain dead, Washington, Washington Street, okay. Here's the Triangle Park. Here is the Odd Fellows building today. Here is the bike shop today. This is the, the back view. I, you know, I try to always take a current photograph to show then and now. Could not do it for this area. Because of all the trees, it was totally blocked. There was no way I could get a picture to show a comparison today. But look at this, it's a dirt road. Um, you can just sell. Here's Wisconsin Street. It's a river on the left side. 
Yes, the river would be over here. Correct. Uh huh. Yep. So you're going. Here's going down the hill. Here's Washington. Here's going down the hill. Here's the bike shop. Then the next comes Otto. Okay. So it's a pretty cool picture. Here's the woolen mills. This is on the west side of the river. You see the water? It's off in the water raceways. All these mills were powered by water at this time, which we'll talk about more in a little while. Now, this is an actual photograph of the window and the planing mill, the window and sash manufactory that Carpenter owned. This was located, like I told you, originally where Otto's parking lot is in the back today. This was there. So this is an actual photograph, and this is totally cleaned up. This picture was in very poor condition, but I actually was able to re rebuild it, take out all the scratches, and it came out really beautiful. I'm surprised. In 1855, George Marshall, he opened a foundry in a blacksmith shop located on Main Street on the west bank of the Fox River on the south side of the street. Just to help you out to understand where that is, uh, I'll show you a picture of where that was at in a few minutes. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. He catered to the needs of the farmers. Today, this is 11 West Main Street. This is the location of the three-story auto building that has the beautifully restored cupola on top. That's where he built this at. That was the original building. That was, no, I should take that back. That was the original location of the building. The building we have there today is not the same one that he built back then. Here's what I'm talking about. Beautiful structure. And this, by the way, is the oldest structure in the um, complex of the auto buildings today. We'll talk about that a little more. I'm probably jumping the gun, but just in case, I'll say it now. This building was built in 1871. That's when it was built. By the 1860s, though, George Marshall's original foundry and blacksmith shop had developed into a hardware manufacturing company. He had also taken on two partners. So in 1865, they, the partners really, were looking to move the company out of Carpentersville. And they wanted to relocate to a new subdivision that was going up near Chicago called, actually, shouldn't call it a subdivision, a new community called Austin. Austin was brand new at this time. Everybody know where Austin's located at pretty much, near Cicero? And all that area? Yeah. 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 So this is really what we're planning on moving this to. But a group of men from this area, they stepped in. And this small group of settlers formed a new company and named it the Illinois Iron and Bolt Company. How many remember that name here in Carpentersville years ago? Yep. Very well known. So they kept the company here in Carpentersville. They really did a good service for us. But it was in 1868 that Carpenter, he became interested in this company, the Illinois Iron and Bolt. So he took over the management. And anything that Carpenter put his hands on turned to gold. That's the way it was. He was a very, very successful businessman. So this was the beginning of what would grow to become a major industry here in Illinois. And here we see it. Here we see a very early photograph of this area. This is, first of all, remember I told you earlier that he built a wooden bridge? Well, this is an iron bridge. This bridge replaced the wooden bridge. And this, was, this went up in 1869. Now, here's the oldest building I told you about, 1871. Here's also 1871. Then here's 1873. See, the buildings are all numbered, so it went up in sections. Here's building three. Building four is actually behind this here. It doesn't show in the photograph. Here's building five. So this complex developed very rapidly. Do you know what he did? Sure. I've got, I've got to know, did he, was that with Hager Brick? Like the he did. Brick? It was with Hager Brick. And this, I'm glad you mentioned that. Actually, I do mention that in the um, talk. The blonde brick is actually a trademark of Dundee Brick. Okay, Hager Pottery. In case you don't know, Dundee Brick is today called Hager Pottery. David Hager purchased Dundee Brick in 1871. And that was the year of the Chicago Fire. So here he purchases Dundee Brick. The Chicago Fire takes place. He ends up striking a rich because he supplied much of the brick that would rebuild Chicago. 
So it didn't become Hager Pottery until his son took over, and that was later on in the early 1900s. I think, I think from memory it was 1914 that the name was changed to Hager Pottery. Oh, I gotta try and make it over there to see her. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and that's, that's Lexi is a Hager. There's only two companies in, in in Dundee that are still operated, owned and operated by their original founders or owners of you know family, and that is Hager Pottery and D'Angelo Water. Those are the only two companies that exist that have the that are go back to the roots. So it's really cool. This here? Yeah. That is probably the that's probably the school, yeah. Yeah, that's the school. It's it's today is a um retirement home. But it was originally the Union School, I think it was called, the Union School. Yes. That's cool. That's awesome. So you graduated from there? You said you graduated from there? Oh, your aunt. A grandmother aunt. Okay. Okay. Because it was a school not up until, it was actually an operating school even when I was a child. When I was younger, it was still a school. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So, it was a school up, think, uh, well, well into the 60s and not even past that. I'm trying to think. So, anyway. So, 70s, yeah. So, yep, that's, that's pretty cool. It's, it's really glad, I'm glad that you didn't to see that, because this picture was, a, this photograph is very old. And yeah. photographs that are very old deteriorate very, very badly. This photograph, really, the original one was in unbelievable condition. Thanks to technology today, we can do so much to enhance these photographs. This came out pretty good. We already did. This is a cool shot. And I say this is around 1873, but look at the length of this building here. See how the length of it, how short it is? Go back a second here. Look at this here. See how it's longer? No. Um, no, it's not. Because the river's right here. This river right here. Here's the river. Here's, yeah, the basic bridge is over here. See, this river right here. And look, at there's also a, a, a cannon right there. Probably from the Civil War. Could have very well been, you know. But this is interesting to see how short it is. So they hadn't even constructed this here. Here's Building 4 probably right here, okay. So, or it could be part of here. This, no, this is a section for this here. It's over here. It's unbelievable. But it's interesting how fast it grew. So this is around 1873 also. Because we know that's the year this was built. So this is probably early 1873. Now, one of the major factors why this area prospered was because of the river. Rivers were much more than just a source of food and water at this time. They were a source of power. Power. Power that could be used to grain grind, grind grain, cut lumber, refine ore. Water was an essential component of the economy at this time. Water raceways were built to carry water to and from a water wheel. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit. There's a great picture about the raceways. Now, this is a view around 1885, and this is looking east. Now, here's the Fox River right here coming through town, right? But look at here. See the water? There's also one over here on the other side, on the east side, that was used to, to, to um, feed over to where the bike shop is today, which was the mill. But here's the raceway right here, and the water was fed in to these various plants for power. Those were man-made. And this raceway here is still there. You can still see it there. It's empty, it's dry, but it's still there. So I'm gonna show you a picture of that. Here's a great, this is a postcard of the raceway. It's called the Mill Race. So this is how it used to look. It was beautiful. So you can just imagine being here at that time, peaceful, quiet. There weren't any cars. There weren't any airplanes. It was peaceful. There was wildlife. It was beautiful, beautiful area. That's how it looked back then. This is how it looks today. 
<laughs> so today it's just a, it's empty, but the race is still there. It's still there along Lincoln Avenue, and you can't see it because of the the bush, the bush and all that. So usually, like I took this picture in the spring when I took this photograph, so the trees weren't all full of vegetation or leaves and all that. But that's, that's the water race that was still there. Now, also, this is the water gate, and that is still there. This is right by the auto parking lot there, by the water race. This is the gate that they would use to control the water level. So they could control, see, when the rivers dropped back and forth, it could be trouble. Because if the water dropped too low, then you can't use it for power, you see? So with these water races, they could control the flow of the water coming into the mills. And in fact, I found an article. I did this last night, actually, for you guys today. I found this article. This is from the Daily Inner Ocean, which is a Chicago newspaper. This newspaper was dated January 13th, 1881. Okay? It's called The Water Famine. And look what it says down here. Dundee, Illinois, January 12th. The manufacturing companies of this place are suffering severely from low water, but not nearly to the extent represented in dispatches from here to other papers. The Illinois Iron and Bolt Company's works is not shut down, nor are its 300 employees thrown out of work. The Atlantic mills are running all night instead of during the day, it having been agreed to, so divide, to, to divide the use of the water power. Do you see that? So that's from 1881. Isn't that cool? So it kind of shows us here that, you know, these water races were used in, here's an example. People inquire, what did the Illinois Iron and Bull Company make? Here are some examples. Blacksmith drills. Iron cast wagon chains. The wheel would go on here. The wagon wheels. They made cast iron wagon brake shoes. They made hitching posts. Vulcan anvils and polished diamond brand irons. These irons kept women in shape, big time. <laughs> See that there, a number on there? Number eight. What did that stand for? Eight pounds. That's right. It's an eight pounder. So there's various weights of irons you could use. It's an eight pound iron. It's a lot of weight for an iron, you know? So these are all things that were made right here in Carpentersville by the Illinois Iron and Bolt Company. What had begun as a one-man blacksmith shop and developed into, it, what started off as a one-man blacksmith shop ended up developing into one of the largest manufacturers here in Illinois. Here's some pictures of the plants, how it looked. Here's a great overview. This is from the top of Route 31, near 31, looking northeast around 1880. But look at all these buildings. Now this over here, this is star manufacturing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But Illinois Iron and Bolt is all along here. Near the railroad tracks. Very, very busy enterprise taking place here. You can see way over here, the, the, the open area. Julius Angelo Carpenter, he was also the person that started the company that many of us here in this room are also familiar with. And that is Star Manufacturing. Because that name was here in Carpentersville until the 1970s on that building. Star Manufacturing was established by Carpenter in 1873. Their specialty was agricultural tools and implements. Here are some examples of what they made. All things for farmers. Leader cards, um, horse equalizers. I think that's kind of interesting. This is from its name, you can know what it did. You have some horses that are harder worker than other horses. This equalized their workload, so it made total sense. Here's some other factors. This is an advertisement in their actual catalog. I thought this was pretty cool. It says here, Mr. Peterson weighs 165 pounds. He is standing on a 14-inch star wrench. So they were showing the strength of their tools by having this man stand on the wrench. That was in their magazine. 
<laughs> so it's kind of cool. Here's an actual photograph of their warehouse. This is today Otto. Looks familiar, familiar to you, Karen? He used to work there. As you can probably see, you can see this. all this woodwork is still there, just like it was back then. They also made machinery like this, corn husking machines and shelling machinery. Really something else. Here's a great picture. Here's the Otto building today. And here's, this is actually the first building that was built, 1874. This building today has actually been replaced. But this is 1880. This is the one that we all know because it goes right along Main Street right here. But you know how to this day the doors are up higher? Here's why, because they used to have before a walkway there. See, which we can figure out pretty much. Look at the railroad tracks, see? What's by the railroad tracks today? What is that today? The bike path, that's right. The bike path follows the uh, railroad tracks. Various spurs coming off here, going to various, this went to the mill, which is right next door. This is an interesting picture here, I like this picture. Here's the building that we are familiar with to this day. Here is that 1869 Iron Bridge. But look at the buildings back here, all along the river, how they used to look. Those buildings have all been replaced, and they were replaced many years ago. So look at this picture, now watch carefully. Look, you see how it's changed? This was added, here's the building we just saw a second ago. Here this is added in 1904. This photograph was taken in 1909. I know that because look at this here. They're actually building this structure right now. And that building dates to 1909. So that's how, it, we know that was the year. Look at the bridge, how the bridge changed. It went from an iron bridge to a steel bridge. I go back just a second, see that? There's iron, here's the steel. And they changed this bridge to make it stronger so it could handle the trolley and the weight of vehicles and so on. But they were changing at this time. Because this was industrialization. We were going away from horses and buggies to vehicles, trolleys, different things coming across these tracks. Here's a great picture. Here's this model, I think it's a Model T or a Model A. I'm not sure, it's a very, very old truck. By 1910, I would guess, looking at it. But here's pulling all these little wagons full of star manufacturing wares. Isn't that cute? <laughs> so, and here's the tracks. See the tracks? Going across the bridge. This is an awesome view looking east. I figure between 1899 and 1903, this is Lincoln Avenue. Here's the wooden sidewalk. And look at the openness. Here's the water race. Here's the river. Here's the bridge that goes behind Otto, the spur, the bridge, the spur for the train. And here's the actual bridge that's for the uh, on Main Street over here. So you kind of get your bearings from this picture. But look at its openness. Isn't that beautiful? In 1909, Star Manufacturing installed their own power plant for electricity. And that's it to this day. That's how it looks today. But this is how it looked originally. This photograph was taken. Somebody climbed the smokestack to take this photograph. Because there were no airplanes back then. There was no balloons. You know, or maybe there was balloons at this time, but there was no smokestack. So someone had the, the guts to go up in that smokestack to take this photograph. Wouldn't have been me. <laughs> so it's really amazing. Oh, yeah. oh is that in here? Yeah. Okay, he's gone. <laughs> I'll go on. Fix that. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, but see, this is kind of cool. So here's the river. Here's the water race. The water would come in through the water race, and it would it would um, power this plant. That's how it would come right back out. It did. It had a starter. It had a starter generator. That's correct. I may. I don't know if I go into it here or not. Here's the picture of one here. So this is the watchman for the plant, and you're right, there was two generators. There was a starter generator, a small one, and then a much larger one is what there was. And the way it fed, it had wheels that went down into the water, wooden, it was like a wooden gear-like type thing, and that the water coming down would turn that water wheel, and it would turn the generator on top here. 
Here's an actual schematic uh, from 1909 by Alice Chalmers, who built the power plant. This shows how it is. So you had, you had like it came down, and the water would flow through here, and it would turn these wheels, which were wooden wheels, and it would come, come back out, and it would turn these generators. So with the progression of time, companies come and go. Star Manufacturing, which started in 1873, was still here in 1977, 104 years later. But for any of us that are, that, how many of us here were back, living here at that time in the 70s? I know I was. I was here since 58. So not too many of us, you know. I will tell you, the way the buildings look today is beautiful. It wasn't that way when I was young. They were run down. Buildings that are 100 years old get run down. That's just the way it is. That happened to Carpentersville. So large portions of the buildings that were once home to these companies were vacant. The once majestic and well-built buildings had fallen into a serious state of disrepair. That's how it was. Here's examples of how they looked. This is back in the 70s. Broken windows, um, decaying, the parking lots, junk cars in there. Boarded up windows. See, this is in a poor condition. This is how it looked. Look at the roof line. You know, it was very sagging, unkept, poor condition. This is the condition of the buildings. Here's the power plant, sat vacant, empty for years, disuse. The back, where Otto's parking lot is today, the junkyard pretty much. This is the way it was when I was a kid. Graffiti, run over. It, if measures weren't going to be taken soon for this area, destruction by a wrecking ball would be imminent. There's no question about it. So in 1968, a man stepped onto Main Street in Old Carpentersville. He had the vision and the insight to see beyond the rubble, the soot, the debris, and the disrepair. No one could have imagined that a small company would come in and change the entire dynamic of a community. But that's what happened. The company is Auto Engineering. And the man who formed the company is Jack Roser. When Otto first moved to Carpentersville in 68, there were just 12 employees. And here they are right here in this picture. And this is the building. This building today is gone. But this is the building he moved into. Their new location was an abandoned liquor store, and the address was 36 East Main. So by 79, although they had added on to the location, they were ready for another expansion. They added all this on. They've changed the whole face of the building. Here's the Oddfellows right here. This is a, today is a, is a, it's all grassed in today, and it's partly a parking lot. By 1979, this would be a beginning of a renovation of the historic business district of Carpentersville. This is when things would really start to change. So this is the complex that Otto purchased, this whole area. What a change from that one little building right here to this. It started with one man in his basement. Jack Roser started his business in his basement by himself. And then he had grown to 12 employees in 68. Otto was... Jack's father. That's his father's name. All right? I think that's what it is. Yeah. Tom's grandfather. Yes. Tom Roser runs it today. Tom's his son. That's his grandfather. You're right. So it's Jack's father. That's why he named it Otto. Okay. See, I'm going to ask Karen because Karen worked at Otto for a long time. And actually, I met Karen there at Otto. So it was interesting. So in 1979, Otto purchased this entire property. And it was transformed from this to this. So you can see the different the total upgrade. It's unbelievable. Major change. Here's the parking lot, how it used to look. Here's how it looks today. Never forget. That's why I did this book. One of the reasons why I did this book and why Tom wanted this book done so that we would never forget and take for granted how it looks today. Because it didn't look this way not too many years ago. But this is how it looks today because of the work of what they've done. It's amazing. 
Here's the power plant. Absolutely. Yep. Almost all these photographs that are all these old photographs are from Tom. That's where I got them from. Here's when they're doing the work, reconstruction of the power plant. They actually were setting this up to be operational or operable. He wanted to run this power plant again. He actually he has one of the generators in working condition, but he is now allowed to operate it because of the fact of the water engineers, I forget what you call them. That's the wrong Civil term. Engineers. Civil engineers, yeah, they won't allow it. They say it diverts the water. I can argue that, but you know what, it is what it is. So he can't operate it. Yeah. That's how it looks today. It's a park today, it's beautiful. This is a great picture then and now. This picture is, there's Jack. And they're starting to work. This is the yellow building that was used to be in the back there of the parking lot. See the smokestack here? Here's how it looked. Here's how it looked, the exact same spot today. What a difference, huh? In 2005, Otto purchased the property on the west bank of the river. I remember sitting in Tom's um, office. When I did my first book, Dundee Township Moments Frozen in Time, back in 2001, that's when I met Tom Roser. And I was, was sitting in his office and we were talking about the uh, building, this building over here, how badly he wanted to have that and be able to renovate it. But he couldn't at that time, you know, he didn't have the, they wouldn't sell it. It wasn't available at the time. But we remember we talked about it back then. He was looking forward. He actually had the vision way back then of making all these changes. And finally it materialized. So these buildings were in a need of a major cleanup and renovation when Rosers bought them. And going back to the second, I kind of jumped the gun. This is when he purchased these buildings on the north side, northwest side of the river. So these buildings were in bad condition. This is how it looked when he purchased it. This is the inside. It was filled with junk and debris. 240 dumpsters of junk were removed. 240. That's one dumpster per day for nine months. Isn't that amazing? That's how it was. You know, I'm sure, you know what? There, I'm, you know what? I I would think there is, must have been something, yes, but I don't know what to tell you. I know that he has some, he does have some glass cabinets in there that have some artifacts that go back to Illinois Iron and Bolt. And maybe those are some things he found that, in there that could have very well been. And also he has the, like, the original Alice Chalmers schematic I showed you. He had that. He has, and those, those are all treasures, you know, things like that. So absolutely he did in that sense. But this is kind of cool. This is the basement. This is before. Here's how it looks today. Is that beautiful? I mean, the work that's been done is amazing. Just beautiful. Here is before. There's how it looks today. So, this is impeccable. Exact same spot, same door, same window. This to this. I love that and now. You know, it really helps you. It's really powerful, isn't it? Just beautiful. I think Julius Carpenter would be very happy, don't you? <laughs> From this, there's a side view. There's how it is today. Overview of how it used to look. That's how it is today. Beautiful picture. In January 2008, Otto was able to purchase the final piece of parcels and property that made up the original Illinois Iron and Bolt. 
And these buildings were the oldest. And they were in the most serious state of neglect. These buildings here. Look at the rough line. Look at this. Look at this. That's how it was. It's unbelievable. Here they are starting to do reconstruction. Taking off the wood. This was all blocked up with wood for decades and decades. All the old windows and so on. Here's the interior, how it used to look. That's how it looks today. This is beautiful. Done, everything is done top notch. All the wiring is run under the floors. Um, this, there's so much things he did to make this soundproofing, and this, this is just amazing. It's a beautiful building. This is the um, called the shed building. The long one that goes along the river there. That's how it used to look. That's how it looks today. At this point in time, this is just as it looks right now. It's used right now for special, um, it's rented out for various occasions. Jack Roser just passed away, actually almost one month to the day today. He died last month. And actually, we actually had um, visitation for his death in this building, which is a fitting place to have it. So I was there, I got there at 3.30 in the afternoon thinking I would get there early. It took me two and a half hours to get to Tom. That's how long the line was. At 3 o'clock, 3.30. So there must have been a, there, I would estimate it, at least 300 people were there at least in line before I got there. We were lined up from the doorway, we were back and forth. It didn't stop. He had a huge impact on the community. This is how this building looks to this day. Actually, I work with auto engineering. I take care of a lot of their supplies now and stuff. And he actually hired my company to bring a company in to do this floor for him. We just buffed this floor yesterday. They want this floor to be like glass. It's perfect. And you can tell it is. It's beautiful. Here's a picture from the, from the roof, how it used to look. That's how it looks today. The restored cupola. It's beautiful. Oh yes, it's a good point. There are there are tenants, and there are numerous tenants in other parts. That one large shed building itself, there's not, but there are in the offices on the on the north side, and then on the south side as well. There's also tenants. You are right. The Granite Company is there. I forget what else is there, but the granite company I know for sure because I've actually been in there. If you ever, ever, if you ever need some granite, like um, tabletops or whatever, unbelievable store. It's beautiful. So the granite store is in there. So This is the parking lot today. This is how it used to look, though, but this is how it looks today now. See the difference? Beautiful change has taken place. Here's along Lincoln Avenue. This is where the um, stores are at to this day, which I'll show you here. Foundry? Right now? Oh, you mean years ago you're talking about? You mean, mean years ago? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely they did. Absolutely. Good picture of how it used to be. How it looks today. So you can see what happens here. They actually, a lot of the windows were blocked up and so on over the years, bricked up. Yeah, they do that. Yeah. So you reopen up all the windows, put in new other windows. It's very careful to re um, rebuild. Um, I think it's, well, it's still there the same way. So you know, actually, you can see here the roof line here. Yeah, so he changed a little bit there, so it's good. Did beautiful work, didn't he? He actually hired Polish brickmen, bricklayers. They came from Poland, the crew that did all his work, his brickwork. They did it for all his buildings. They came from Poland. They were very, very articulate. They did a great job. 
these bricks were cleaned up. These were all the original bricks. They were all cleaned up. And sometimes the bricks were so bad and worn out, they would actually take the bricks and take them out, and they would reverse them, put them back in backwards sometimes, you see. So it was a good idea, you know. So they did a great job. So the, the brick that was used pretty much is all the original brick that goes back to the 1800s. On the walls, I mean those stars. People think, as a, people think that the stars are used as a, as a trademark for star manufacturing. That is not the case. What happens is when they built an old building, see here, oh, I hit the wrong button there. Like see here, like the dots there, the little stars there and stuff. There's something, one over here. What those are used for, all old buildings have that. And the reason why, those are structural factors. There's rods that go through the building. And those are hunted to steel rods to help to keep the building plumb and, and straight and up is what it boils down to. That's what it is. So it, that's why those are there. And they are stars, but that isn't anything to do with star manufacturing. <laughs> okay. Here's a great picture of how it used to look. Really old, showing how old and decayed it was. But look at this picture today. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, this is a great picture. This is showing old Carpentersville. Here's Lincoln Avenue. Here's coming down the hill from 31 in the old Carpentersville. How it used to look, and that's how it looks today. And I take this picture early in like in March because the minute they've got trees, or I mean or leaves on those trees, I couldn't get the picture anymore. So I got it as close as I could get it to be matched up, so it's kind of cool. So Carpentersville was established and prospered because of the efforts and good business sense of Julius Angelo Carpenter. Although J.A. Carpenter is credited with the founding of and development of Carpentersville's business district, it's because of two other men that we today enjoy the pristine beauty of a completely renovated and impeccably maintained historic business district. And I gotta tell you, you would be hard pressed to find another historic business district in the country that can compare to Carpentersville. The two men behind this renovation and restoration that you've just previewed is Jack Roser and his son Tom. Today, the Rosers and their company, Otto, own and occupy the beautiful building complexes on both sides of the Fox River. Jack Roser, he left us just one month ago. He passed on June 13th, 2014. He has left a legacy that will not soon be forgotten. All this is an example of what Otto owns today. What you've just previewed is about one-third of the photos in the new book, The Historic Business District of Carpentersville. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you.